welcome to this Monday Thursday service. Just a reminder, if you still would like to gather some bread enough for your household and some cups of wine or juice, you can do that uh, before continuing in this service. And then I will, uh, after the words of institution, uh, eat and we can eat together that way, even if, though we're apart, and then also drink together and have communion that way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were called at baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days, reconciled with God and with one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of If You But Trust in God to Guide You. <coughs>
Jesus gave us a new commandment, to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Tonight we have two readings read by Kevin Nelson and Ray Johnson. first reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The first Passover instituted. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are take, to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it, take him from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at the twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins gritted, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, and on all gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you in the houses where you live, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it in festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Here ends the first reading. Second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. The institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received him from the Lord, what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is, a, this is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This is the cup, new this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here ends the reading. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, tonight we continue with the Lord's Prayer, the sixth petition, and lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God indeed tempts no one, but we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our flesh may not deceive us nor seduce us into misbelief 
despair, and other great shame and vice. And though we be assailed by them, that still we may finally overcome and gain the victory. And lead us not into temptation. Tonight I want to especially emphasize this in connection with, quite appropriately, the Lord's Supper. For Monday, Thursday, and Holy Week, remembers that on this night, Jesus gathered the disciples together and celebrated the Passover meal. Many of our Jewish brothers and sisters are doing that exact same thing tonight. They are celebrating the Passover. As the Exodus reading says, God instructed them to continue to do this through all generations. And so we have Jesus and the disciples doing the same thing, and we, through the generations, have also continued to celebrate the Passover, but in the way in which Jesus instituted something new using the same bread and the same wine. The temptation, I believe, comes from many directions. The temptation to disbelief, or the temptation, as it says, to despair and other great shame and vice. One way in which we are tempted, I believe, in the Lord's Supper is tempted by simply shrugging it off and saying it's not important, making very light of it staying away because somehow it's just insignificant and so causing us to continue to doubt and not have faith. Some other people are drawn away from it because they think it's way too mystical. It's so ethereal and it's so magical that somehow unless they can get their minds around it in a rational way they go well, I can't understand what's going on, so I might as well stay away. A temptation again that leads to disbelief or misbelief. Or, I think, the worst one of all, that temptation to somehow think that we're not included. That we're not included in this great gift, which is exactly what it is. I hope this is an illustration that can help you understand. Remember, this is not the crucifixion we're talking about tonight. We're talking about a meal in which Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, it's the night before he would die. And it is helpful to, I think, instead of translating the word covenant, to use the original translation, which, the, which was the word testament. Remember, the whole Bible is always called the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, what is a testament? One way to think about it is to think about a person making their last will and testament. They are saying, this is what I want to do with what I have. That's a wonderful way of thinking what Jesus was doing. Before he died, he told his disciples, this is what I will for you. I want to read my will, my testament for you. And this is what my testament is. You can have me with you forever. I am giving you myself. As Jesus promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. We have that very specific promise fulfilled in bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ. That's his giving, his will, his testament. And just as maybe some of you have gathered, maybe in a lawyer's office, and have heard a will read, in which you are named as one who receives from somebody who has died property or certain gifts. 
we do joke about that in our family once in a while and say, if you're not good, you're going to get that in your will, in a joking way about some of our less worthwhile things that we have sitting around the house. But Jesus is giving us the very most valuable thing that you could possibly have, the presence of God to forgive your sins forever and ever. This is a testament then. It is Jesus reading his will for his heirs. And what's given is given to you. A gift, forgiveness, and life itself. Some people wonder, well, how often? And there's been some discussion among pastors and theologians about, well, what do we do now during this COVID-19 where we can't get together in community. And some are going off in some kind of strange understandings of this. I was reminded of another time. I came upon in our genealogy a letter that my dad's great uncle wrote back to Norway to tell them how his trip went from Norway all the way to New York, up to Albany, along the Erie Canal, to Buffalo, on a ship to Milwaukee, and into eastern Wisconsin. And when he finally got there, he wrote and said, the baby that was born on board ship in the Atlantic, we have baptized this October, because a pastor comes from 30 miles west of here in April and October and we receive the sacraments, and we receive baptism and communion. Twice a year. Maybe in this congregation not too long ago, you maybe did it three or four times a year. Rather than argue about how much, or how many, or mystical, or how to understand it, I believe that we need to remember that it is God's presence given through the word of promise. Even if you can't commune tonight, or for many, many weeks, God's word of promise is still there. You heard it, and you are hearing it tonight. I am with you. I forgive you. You are mine. After all, I put you in my will and testament. You're my heir. I give you the most precious thing in all of the kingdom of God, myself and my grace. Amen. We sing, There is a balm in Gilead.
hearts to God who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of love, unite your church in its commitment to humble service. Make us your faithful disciples. Speak words of truth and grace through us. Encourage us in self-giving acts of kindness. Let us love one another as you have loved us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, tend to flocks, fields, and vineyards. Bring favorable weather for crops to grow. Guide the hands of those who cultivate, farm, and garden. Let the earth flourish so that all may eat and be satisfied. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you give us a new commandment to have love for one another. We give thanks for organizations that respond to disasters and for agencies that offer relief and humanitarian aid to populations in need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, give ear to all who call upon you for any need of body or spirit. Provide for those who do not have enough to eat, those who are unemployed or underemployed, and those who rely on the generosity of others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you invite us to your table of mercy. Heal all divisions between members of this assembly. Extend the hospitality of this table beyond these walls, that your love and welcome be made known to all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, glorify your servants who walk by faith in this life and who now feast with you. Inspire us by the sacrifice of those who were imprisoned persecuted, or martyred for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our oh, Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, if you would each in your household, if you do have bread, you would take it at this time, is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ's testament for you, make you strong and give you peace. Amen. In preparation for Good Friday, which is a spare and dark service, we will now remove everything that is up on the altar and up in the front area, and we will leave in silence. 
And if you at home would do the same thing, keep silent while we do this, and then have a little time of silence at the end.